I haven't had this much uncertainty since I started Sugaton back in 2018. How big of a needle mover is it? How confident are you in this uh, this hypothesis? How easy is it to, to implement? Matas, for example, who has uh, spent $2 million per month on his own. Your audience actually has no meaning whatsoever on TikTok. What's up, guys? Uh, welcome to the almost weekly show <laughs> with Sugatan. Uh, my name's Callum. I am a host of the show and part of the marketing team here at Sugatan. In the bottom right corner, we have Travis. Um, Travis is an ad buyer here and proud owner of the most manicured beard in Sugatan. In the top left corner, we have Matas. Matas is a senior ad buyer here. He is the proud owner of the largest biceps in Sugaton. Uh, and then last but not least, we have Chris. And Chris is the proud owner of, well, Sugaton. Uh, so the, the whole point of today's call uh, is, one, to, to give a lot of value to our audience and two, to really give a window into what it's like here at Sugaton, the internal culture, and just some really down to the bones, raw, good information. The topic of today's chat specifically is that assumption is the mother of all screw ups, uh, as especially in business, you know, it applies to everything, everyday life. And why wouldn't it apply even more so probably to business? And specifically today, we want to talk about um, the differences when when you are validating your assumptions when you are backing them up with experience with data versus when you aren't and maybe some really specific examples like a b testing uh something like that so this is really not my my area of expertise i'm here to kind of jump in every now and then with a question uh, and i really want to hand it over to the three big dogs in the room to discuss uh why assumption is the mother of all screw-ups in business What's up, guys? First of all, um, we're this is the inner workings. This is what's super relevant to us now. You know, 2022, um, I basically labeled as the year of innovation inside Suga Time. And <clears throat> innovation, what that means is that we are coming into completely new territory. Like I haven't had <laughs> this much uncertainty since. I started Sugaton back in 2018, no joke, about like, we're going back to the very beginning, you know, of, our, of like what our assumptions from the very beginning are about the market, about the channels, about the algorithm, about buying intent, you know, and there's a lot going around right now. Um, and I think it's really, really important that I began to highlight even a statement that is said by Mata, for example, European market is not a good time to, to pursue at the moment because it's a low buying intent time, i.e. beginning of January. And while we know from historically that has been our experience, I think that it's important to go through at least recognizing that that is an assumption that at least we should design a hypothesis or a test around to at least validate that assumption, even if it's just, well, in this particular account, we're, we're spending six figures per month. But like, even if it's just $1,500 to test or $2,500 to test in the larger picture, of you know, let's just say 500,000, that's not that much, but that's enough to at least be like, okay, we validated that data instead of like leaving it hanging as, you know, making a conclusive conclusion about it. Does that make sense? <laughs> this is like the most relevant like thing that I can think of right now. And Travis, I think you've been doing such a great job in, in the skincare brand that we launched that you, you've, been, you've been doing this path of AB testing, very methodical, you know, and I think, I think that's what we can speak about. I, I want to talk about the reason why making assumptions in the first place is so dangerous. And the reason is because like, 
as humans, the way that we process information and when we come up with a problem, we want to process that information and come up with a solution as quickly as possible, right? But when we do that, we're using our unconscious bias. And our unconscious bias is something that we form over our entire lifetime through years of experiences and our, our, our personal beliefs and our environment. Um, but the problem is that our unconscious bias is often skewed and it contains a lot of stereotypes. So to give you an example, when I was a kid, um, I was presented some kind of green vegetable and I, you know, had to sit down and I couldn't leave the table until I finished it. And I was eating it. And I'm like, oh, this tastes horrible. And it was like, I, I said right then, like, I hate vegetables. Vegetables are all disgusting, right? So I formed this bias. So anytime I was presented with a vegetable in the future, I would not eat it because, you know, I always had it in my head that they're, they're really bad. And it wasn't until like I became an adult that I realized that, you know, there's some really good vegetables out there and I, and I missed out because I was using my, my biases, right? Um, so it's, it's really dangerous to just assume something. And that's why we really, uh, we need to, like you said, form hypothesis and we need to, our, our hypothesis is backed up with an assumption, but that assumption is data-based, right? It's based off of data, right? It's not just how we strongly feel about something because we're not always correct about something, right? We need to really put it, form a, form a hypothesis, run it through a proper A-B test with you know specific uh, outcomes, KPIs to track, and then from there, we can, we can make our decisions based off of uh, what we find. Yeah, and you know, um just from a very like this has been the biggest sort of thing that i've been trying to solve for is there's assumptions happening all over the place so there is a there are, there's assumptions from let's just say the investor's perspective very very high level right um the person who is pouring in resources into the entity or the business and then there's like the assumptions that are happening on those who are on the ground level actually executing, right? Which is like taking their high level assumptions and then going into a, a sub, sub assumptions on whatever the channel is, let's just say, right? And so I think that what's, what's always been challenging, I think for a lot of um, entrepreneurs is like the organization of, of how do you execute on those assumptions? Because I think in digital marketing, you can go like a thousand ways <laughs> at any moment in time. So I guess like, let's just say in the aspect of ad buying, how do you guys go about, you know, deciding out of the many assumptions that you guys can go down and maybe just give some concrete examples? Um, how do you decide which ones to actually commit to? Like, what is your, your, cause you, right. Like, isn't there like so many decisions and so many paths that you can go down on? So how do you choose the ones to actually test? And let's just you know, say it from the ad buying perspective. You know, I always say that <clears throat> you'll never have enough budget to test everything that you want. You know, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't That's, matter how big the account is, right? Yep. And and you know, Travis was right. You know, the the first thing is data, obviously reading the data and finding because most of the time you can really find answers in existing data, right? Yes, sometimes you know we're in places where you don't have data for that, right? And then the experience needs to kick in if you have any, right? But data and experience, I think, is is being summed by risk versus reward decision making, right? Because uh, it's, you know, if you have 10 tests to run, but you see that you can only run three of them, right? You start asking yourself questions, you know, how much I'm, how much risk is there, right? And how much reward can I get uh, out of this, this stage, right? So, you know, obviously we always want the lowest risk uh, and highest reward uh, in practical life, not always that's, you know, possible, but still, you know, finding that uh, helpful, healthy, uh, balance between risk and, and reward, I think is, is the way to go. Yeah, because you know what I found, um, you know, we have, I think inside Sugaton, we've had this methodology for like the last three years. Um, and then the algorithm is changing. Um, and now I say that because this, let's say proven methodology that we've had for the last three years that scales all these businesses, we didn't really take a lot of risk to to experiment outside of that method methodology 
And I think that moving forward, going into risk reward, I think that we should still lean on data, lean on experience, but I think make room for, let's just say 20% of our actions should be investing towards innovating. Does that make sense? Like, you know, like at least in my case, you know, innovation often comes from both experience and data. Like, I mean, experience sometimes just suggests that, you know, something is out there, right? And and data patterns can all, you you know, data patterns will show you the, pro the problem, right? And then you'll use innovation and, and some cases to solve the problem, right? So it's all, it's innovation mm -hmm. is tied into, into, mm -hmm. Both. It's like, in my perspective, right. it's one thing that's always connected, you know, into one. If we take, you know, um, our biggest account, right, and what we've innovated so far in the last, let's just say, six months, what really pushed the needle, you know, those decisions that they made, they came from, you know, first from data patterns, you know, uh, understanding, you know, the problem, then leaning on experience, you know, to see how can I solve the problem and then, you know, thinking about the attention spans and all of that and, and innovation was tied into that, right? Because we did innovate, we did new things, right? So it's, it's, it's a, yeah. Like and and to, give the, to give everybody context at that level of innovation, you know, um, what we saw as a pattern is that all, um, many businesses dipped during June. Um, dipped as in like the revenue went down by 50%. Um, and that was right at the cusp of like, really when the iOS release um, was like pretty much when, when Apple forced the release. Um, and, and, then, and then we all dipped in June and then Matas innovated the ad buying strategy in order for us to basically go back up and scaling. And that was the only time that we had that massive dip but ever since then our accounts have been steadily going up um sort of like the way that the, the type of results that we were used to scaling the accounts except that now i think not this you're like double time inside the accounts <laughs> you're spending like twice as much time inside ads manager as you used to on a daily basis right mostly mostly yeah, yeah. <laughs> fighting, fighting over the facebook a lot of people get this idea that um, the only way you get reward is risk and that risk is just diving into things uh, without even thinking about it. Take an artist, for example, when an artist gets to the point of pushing the envelope or changing something, it's because they've already got to the point of being insanely good at everything else already. It's a conscious decision. And it's the same with taking a risk. It's it's a risk, but with you know, you've cut, you've still, you haven't just assumed that it's going to work still. You've, you've backed it up with years of experience and knowing exactly what you're doing before you even take that risk. It's, it's still a very calculated process. It's not just like a, you know, I'm just going to do this and hope it works because I can't think of anything else. It's, it's still like a, you still have to really know what you're doing and really back it up with, with solid information. That, that's correct. Because as long, as long as risks are calculated, these are good risks, you yeah. know, uh, when you know how much you lose, let's just say if, 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 you know, that thing will fail, right? I actually want to share with you guys um, the, the book that, um, that is informing me um, on a lot of these risk reward analysis decisions that I'm, I'm uh, incorporating inside Sugaton. The book is called Levers. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, my dog is like running around the room, but this is the book. And, um, you know, this he, he actually puts through this process where we go through mind mapping and we're putting in all of our assumptions about what are the drivers that will make the high impact drivers from everybody. You know, let's say all the lead strategists, we're all putting it on post-it notes and then um, and then you put a star on the ones that is actually backed by data um, on that account specifically. And then you put a star if it's backed by experience, but not necessarily that account specifically. And then you put a circle. Um, if you know, if out of all of those post-it notes, let's say we have 40, you have to put a circle on the ones that, um, that you know for a fact that is so critical to the business 
um, either it's going to, you're going to experience exponential growth or you'll die <laughs> as a business. And you have to put a circle on that. And <clears throat> I've gone through this process now, I think with like four different teams. And one thing that I noticed about myself, which I wasn't cognizant of, is that all of my ideas are actually not backed by data <laughs> that I'm like a very high risk, innovative person in general. And, um, and out of doing this with, with like four teams now, it's like, it's insane because I'm actually the one that normally has like a, a high level decision to tell the team, go do this. And then I didn't even realize, oh shit, this is actually like a high risk like assumption that I have, but that's why it needs to be, it needs to ki be killed ASAP. Because if, I, if, if that's the thing that is going to create like exponential growth or it dies, we need to actually validate that ASAP. Does that make sense? And for me, my process is really about my number one strength is, um, and, and this is based on Clifton strengths, and it's totally true because this is how I see the world. My number one strength is collecting information from multiple sources and then seeing the patterns right and um and so that's where my assumption comes from because it's about analyzing facebook's algorithm instagram's feed tiktok's feed all the new sources the team all the things that are happening in the account and then immediately i'm like this is where we need to go right and and i just wanted to share that because it's been such an interesting process yeah. And uh, I want to add to that to the way that I also kind of prioritize this, because as we start digging into the data and as we start picking up these trends, like when you run a test, you'll have like five different tests that can come out of those results and that data. So you will soon you'll soon have a very large list of, of things to go after. And, and Mata said, we only have so much budget. So the framework that I actually use is called ICE. So it's impact, confidence, and ease. And it creates a formula. So your impact, like how big of a needle mover is this? Is this gonna give you exponential growth or not? Confidence, how confident are you in this uh, this hypothesis? And ease, how easy is it to, to implement? Like, do you have to have um, a bunch of ad copy written? Do you have to modify the website? And by putting scores, into each of these columns, it'll actually automatically rank the priority for you. So again, you don't get trapped in your, your own biases of which you should focus on. You let the data tell you what to focus on and you run the test and you just go one by one and let them go through. And I found a lot of success in this, um, mm -hmm. you know, running this framework. Yeah, we have a prioritization sheet that we go through, especially when we're creating creatives. Actually, Callum, we went through this process together recently. We had a we we basically did the same thing with the sticky notes, right? Where we we yeah. came up with everyone in the creative team came up with ideas, um, and we rated them all. We rated them whether we have data to go on either from ourselves or from someone else, um, and the importance and also basically um, the ease of implementation, whether we can do it this week, next week, or whether it's a thing that's kind of in the future. And we we. I suppose in a very rudimentary numberless way formulated which which ideas are the best ones and and that's how we kind of narrowed our our ideas down to the and then yeah. and then we went into fast execution yep. well and, i did yeah you we've, know? we've already and, got like three four of them on the road and it's been two days three days so and then it's like it builds that the team is confident about it too which i think is really important not just that you're confident about it, but like the team whose participation that you need in order to like actually get it going, their level of confidence has also gone up. And then it's like a true alignment together. Yeah. And it removes, the, it, it removes the individuality of it as well, because it's easy as with any idea, it's kind of, <laughs> it's my idea. Um, and <laughs> if, if, not, if someone says that's a bad idea, it's like, no, how dare you? But if it's, if it's got a, if your system is bad because numbers say it's bad or if your idea is bad because numbers say it's bad or good, whatever, it's just the way it is. There's no really way to argue it, which I think also helps a lot. Uh, you, you know what? Uh, I was listening to, to Kelly and Chris now and I just remember that uh, I guess the most primitive way to validate your assumptions, and I'm doing this, by, by the way, myself, and I, I remember we, we did that with Sugitan like last year somewhere, uh, we we kept asking question why 
for three or five times in a row, right? And and this is my exercise. I'm doing it every single day. Whenever I'm making some sort of uh, you know decision, I'm like, why? Answer why? Answer why? And so it's either three or five levels of why, and it's always uh, just makes <clears throat> things clear, you know, or or you understand uh, it uh, better somehow. Yeah, like at the essence or at the core, you strip it down. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say is um, just adding, it's really great that we also have the entire team putting our ideas together because we all have such a diverse, you know, skill set and backgrounds and, you know, we're across the globe. So, I mean, like we have all these different, like amazing ideas and all pulled together, you know, we could really come up with some, some great uh, test to run. Yeah. Okay, so that is actually, P.S., a pattern that I understood about digital marketing and why we have to be a flat organization, i.e. there is no manager and then director and VP and then C-level suite. And now inside Sugaton, we call each other like mentors, right? And mentors are really the ones who really are the ones who has built the most experience through ad spend. That's really it. Because uh, the more that you spend um, in media buying, the, in e-commerce specifically in digital marketing channels, social media channels, like you build your intuition very quickly, right? And it's really just about having this, like Matas, for example, who has uh, spent 2 million per month on his own, right? And he has built the intuition very rapidly or like he knows the shortcuts, right? Because he knows all the traps in, in spending 2 million per month in ad spend. And it's super, <clears throat> I realize that the pattern, even for myself, who not only has Matis's experience in ad buying, but I know it from many, many e-commerce accounts over the years. I know it from the video ad perspective and the graphics ad perspective and the copywriters perspective. I still don't have the answer, <laughs> which is why I had to develop Agile, you know, inside Sugaton so that everybody comes together because it's like the one idea that somebody else has. Like, like when we went through this process with Callum and the, and the Sugaton marketing team, holy shit, like I understood what, how like every single one of us thought so differently, you know? And, and that was actually such a illuminating. And again, it validates the whole thing. Like I would say that I'm only right on the most high level, top level things. You know, the whole like making the decision about incorporating humor. I didn't know, I didn't need to go to Ibis World, you know, marketing research firm to know that male humor was going to be the way to go if you're going to sell a male brand, you know, like, I, like that's on a very top level. But I think everything after that, I'm just in the same boat as everybody else, like inside the skin, the female skincare brand that we're, we're working with right now. I'm still at a, the same, like, okay, I have no idea what's going to go viral. <laughs> and like, we have to all come together to really like pick on each other's brains to, to be like, well, the data shows this, the data shows that my level of intuition and knowing what works on the feed we all kind of like come together and then, and then all of a sudden we get a viral ad magically. 90% of the time, it's the one you think that's never going to go, that goes viral. So how do you incorporate that with, with back, backing everything up with data? How can you kind of incorporate the testing with the, the like the volatility of videos and of the internet how do you kind of mesh those two together before you post something it's really just about being studious i think on um on your feed so like i remember when i when we first started doing posting video ads on the facebook and instagram feed at that time not a lot of advertisers were even doing video and um and so any kind of video was doing well and then over time i would say I would say like maybe March of last year, I was like, well, gosh, 
now I'm going into my feed and I see UGCs everywhere and there's bad UGCs. And, and like, I noticed that UGCs, all the advertisers are now doing UGC. So then that kind of gets watered down in terms of its effectiveness. Um, and so then, then you have to evolve. And it's really just about, I think the most powerful tool is really just studying your own feed and probably just taking it, it no joke. It's like 10 minutes a day, two times a day when you wake up and then when you go to bed or if you're at lunch and you just scroll it and just look at the top three ads that show up mm-hmm. and you will, you will cultivate your intuition very quickly. And I'm doing that for mostly Facebook, um, mostly TikTok. Those are the two channels that I'm basically like um, studying. And when the, when the creative team does the same thing on their own, then everybody sort of like starts to say the same thing. You know, what's stopping my thumb is the collage. Yeah. And you'll start to see that people are like noticing, everybody is noticing that the same thing is capturing their attention and why. And actually this morning, that's when I thought about this or yesterday, I was like, everybody, even the ad buyers, you guys should be just scrolling your feed and then just see the top three ads that make it to the top of your feed. I swear it takes like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And if you do that every day, you'll cultivate your own understanding of what actually works on the feed. That's why the, that's why like with Mattis, you know, we, like the IG reels is a big thing because, you know, yeah. And this is where it gets super tricky because from the ad buying perspective, the low risk is to go broad auto placements, you know, but like, IG reels show a lot of potential, even in the most recent test that you did, Travis, for, for the skincare brand, you know, you're saying, well, link CPC is really high, but those are the ones that are actually moving through the checkout, right? But link CTRs are really low, but the buying intent is high from, from, that, from that demographic. But all, all it tells me, it, it just validates that all the, a lot of of the eyes are on IG reels. Like there is a ton of people whose eyes are on IG reels and even Matis and, and mine and your, like, look at your own behavior, you mm-hmm. know, because I think all of us are looking at IG reels, for example, rather than spending a lot of time on feed, you got to look at your own, like, cause that's that, that your representation of uh, out of 10 people yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. I suppose then it, your, everyone's individual assumptions when put together actually become another point of data because you start noticing yep. everyone saying IG reels are really important. Everyone's probably right, you know, that's so, and then you'll notice overlaps in ideas and that sort of thing. So it's actually when utilized right and when properly organized assumption can be another piece of data but when it's all collected and put together versus just one person going i'm going to do this because i think it's going to work yeah yeah exactly and that's why it's important for us to come together and 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 discuss which is very difficult to do as a 100 percent remote international (laughs) team super fucking hard to do that's our biggest barrier honestly go ahead Marcus. you know you just reminded me uh it's funny because it's it was a similar. It, it was actually actually a line of. Um, it it was a process to how I came to this decision that you know I need to go testing reels back in September I think right, and and one of you know somewhere in that process I was like you know, like I'm going into reels every day instead of like all of the other places you know and and it was the same like you know, like in 2020 I believe with IG stories right when. IG stories were booming so much and everyone was going there and we were like, it's just, it's kind of following, uh, following where the attention is going, you know, uh, and, and you, you can understand that from yourself, from your friends, from your, you know, everyone around you kind of, kind of same thing, uh, you know, everywhere uh, with the attention span. Yeah, you know, you can cut this out, Callum, if, it, if Matis is offended by this statement, but Matis and I spent two and a half months together and we had this like almost open door policy because he had his own apartment. You know, we were in the same building and he was like on the third floor and I was on the first floor. And half the time that I would go into Matis's apartment, he was on the toilet 
and I would hear him watching IG reels. <laughs> Honestly, I'm like, this, is, this is my thing that I do, you know. Research time. <laughs> yeah, like, I know. Best yeah. concentration time right there. No distractions. Yeah. No, no time wasted, you know. Like, I know. Before, before, before I used to play uh, like, uh, you know, those mobile games. Uh, but, but now, yeah, like I'm, I go to TikTok and Reels. But see that, okay, so, so just FYI, that's no joke. I take that as a cue. I'm not joking. Like, and then I'm, I'll be like in the subway in New York or whatever. And I'm literally looking at what people are looking at on their phones. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the best. Actually, when I'm on the subway in New York, I'm always looking because everybody's on their phone. Everybody, right? And I'm always looking and I'm always like looking over and trying to be like all low key about it. But like, I'm staring at what people are, what they have open you know because like all I really need is just to see the pattern day over day yeah. and it's always the same thing it's a music app it's a messaging app like whatsapp or iMessage it's dms on social and it's um facebook instagram and then tiktok yeah and youtube like that's basically what every imagine how many fucking millions of people and every single person is just using those three like functions on their phone it's insane I lately, it, it's actually off topic, but I don't know. Now I, I want to share this, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> in past three, four months or something, you know, because I'm scrolling, you know, you know, reels or something every day. Uh, but sometimes I go back to Facebook newsfeed, although it's not really, uh, I don't really use it anymore, right? But I go there with a purpose of research, but a different kind of research, right? Because uh, I've, came, I've come to a conclusion that, you know, the video itself and the message or, you know, the content and all of that, of course, matters. But what matters uh, too is the way your video appears in a feed from, from, I don't know, like, let's just say, not necessarily the ratio perspective, but the way it looks like as a form, right? Because I remember when last year we discovered collages, this was one of the, you know, biggest needle movers is that it just looked completely different in the feed, right? When you scroll now, like you, you can look through 10 videos and they'll all start the same. It's gonna be UGC, it's gonna be mo most likely headline with something, you know, but it feels the same, you know, it doesn't matter that the product, the message, the whatever is different, but it just, it just looks the same, right? So, uh, you know, when I go into Facebook feed, you know, I'm just trying to always come up with something that would look completely different because mm -hmm. that, instantly would stop my thumb right just because like without even looking into video that would stop uh, my thumb just because it looks different from the form uh, of video itself right yeah and that's the thing it's like it doesn't even that's what i learned it doesn't even matter if like for example matas you know matas i don't think could have really from when he first started could say this is what a female buyer in beauty would respond to, <laughs> you know? But like now he goes into one of our accounts because to, to try to give ideas to the creative team about what would work, which is the buyer is a female millennial buyer. And he's saying things like, you need to bring out the emotion like basically your intuition has cultivated so well that like at this point you didn't say anything different than i would have said to the team you get what i'm saying about this and i've noticed yeah. this for all ad buyers who are basically european that don't know a lot about american culture that don't know the buying behavior of a millennial woman and like over a period of a year, that intuition builds so well just through doing this data analysis that after a year, whenever I come into a strategy session, the ad buyer is leading it. I'm like, they got it. <laughs> you know, like they understand how a girl would respond to buy this beauty product. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, you know, after after watching hundreds of accounts and, and their ad libraries and all of that, you know, <laughs> you, you get a feeling of what's repeating. You know, if it's repeating, it's working, right? 
yeah exactly Travis, you, you look like you had something to say uh, I was just going to touch on the the thumb stopper and what some people are doing to stand out these days. Like Sam Ovens, he will put an ad, like the image will be a giant pink image and a big white writing. This is an ad. And then they'd be like, this is an ad. And this is why I, I only read this ad for you to stop and to start reading my text here. And this is why you should read my text and they go through. So um yeah, it's, it's kind of challenging because sometimes you want to get ads that blend in and look like they're not an ad and they look very native and it's something that your friend would post, but other times you just want to stand out. And um, you never, sometimes you never know, even if you have the, the, the data to back up the experience, you got to test it, right? I've, uh, I've had situations where I had to like write three ad copies and I sit down and I get two of them. They're really juicy. I really think they're great. And the third one, I kind of ran out of steam and I'm like, okay, I, I've just got to wrap this thing up and, and push it out. And I'm like, you know what? This third one doesn't even matter because the other two are going to kill it. You yeah. launch it, the two bombed horribly, right? <laughs> and that half fast, half written ad is like the best. And you're like, oh my God, why is this so good? You know? And then like, oh, yeah. I would have written this a little bit better, but yeah, we, we don't know going into it, right? That's why we just got to test it and keep an open mind. And um, if there's anything like people ask me if like, what's, they're, they're just getting to Facebook ads, like, what's your number one advice? I'll be like, don't be emotional, right? Take the emotions out of media buying and let the data talk to you. Because if you go in and say, no, I know this is going to do good. I'm just going to run it for a couple more days. And I know that ROAS is going to show up. It's not coming, right? I know. You, you got to focus you, on those signals and cut it out and just be no, non-emotional. Yeah. That's the hardest part when you're just starting media buying you have to like yeah. remove your like strong conviction over an idea I think for everybody yep. even myself you know I started coming back in to do to develop um creative ideas inside our female skincare and oh my god I'm like like a hawk all weekend I'm like basically refreshing ads manager like every five minutes to be like did this idea work and I'm going in back into that same trap and I'm just like shit and I text Mathis this morning. Tell me, tell me which direction we need to go. <laughs> what do you need from creatives inside? Cause I need Mathis's perspective, you know, about what he's seeing inside, inside ads manager. 99% of the time you aren't the target audience of the advert either. The only thing that can really back up whether an ad is correct for the target audience is whether it works for the target audience or not, you know, and the, and the only person that can decide that is data. <laughs> yeah, that's true. My, my most favorite quote that I, you know, I have this, I have my notes where I uh, write down things that I need to do. It's like my to-do list, right? And on top of those, uh, you know, on top of those notes, I have this quote that I keep reading every single day, right? And whenever I, I have these questions about the audiences, you know, or whether or not it, you know, relates to the audience, I come back to my quote that I want to read to you. So I'm sure you know this, but it's, it's super powerful quote, right? Is that people will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay uh, their fears, confirm the, their uh, suspicions, and help them throw rocks at their enemies. And like every time I come back to this quote, I read it. I take a minute's break to to think about the quote, and then I go back into understanding the the demographics. Like my 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 secret playbook i just posted my very first tiktok video last night i think that honestly travis and mattis you guys should for sure like launch your own tiktok just put up a video and i am shocked that there's 117 views on this video i posted last night because i have four followers no i had two followers as of last night <laughs> so a, i don't even know i changed it to chris suetan You've doubled your followers in one day. That's pretty important. I doubled my followers <laughs> in one day, 200% more likes because I only got two likes. <laughs> but, you know, just like the whole, like, um, I think it's really important that you guys understand the nuances of TikTok, right, mm -hmm. um, on you guys' end and start to develop those patterns, even if it's just Travis, like, you know, it's you and your, it's just you and your kids, or maybe when you guys go out, I don't know, you know, and you mock us when you're working out or something along those lines. Like for me on my downtime, it's, it's all about recall. So my first post was about recall, my dog. And I'm just like, where the heck does this, this, this 117 views come from, you know, which is like a lot for the fact that I have zero presence on TikTok. And I think it's, it's important that we, on on the platforms that we're 
like we said, assumptions and validating those assumptions through data is really important. And even these small actions where you guys get to know the platform is the data point that I think is going to be really impactful to the work that we do. Yeah. I'll I'll start at TikTok, but I'm not dancing. TikTok honestly is one of the it's such a weird social media. It's it it took me forever to get to know it. And now like I've been on it long enough where where like Chris was saying, I can I can kind of I can post a video and go, you know, this is this is at least gonna do okay. This is gonna get this is gonna get views. And the the funniest thing I've noticed about TikTok is often the videos that do the very best or the adverts that do the very best are like um it, tiktok sometimes kind of ambiguous when it's an ad it kind of says tiny at the bottom sponsored and it shows almost exactly like a normal video um and the ones that do the best are ones that are actually normal videos um the most native yeah, where they where they actually it, it's it's an influencer or UGC or whatever, and they they making a TikTok. It's just sponsored. Whereas like if it's been made to look like an ad, it gets dragged so hard. It's it's so that's kind of it's really weird. And and TikTok is, um, it's 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 if it's relatable, if it's if it's relatable it's going to get shared and tiktok kind of it's like if they see shares or downloads or saves it's money signs in the eyes of the video just goes crazy um and if it's like tugging on the hard strings or um often like really super shocking stuff where you see the video and you're like what i need to stop and see what this is about those are generally the three things that do super super well on tiktok by the way, Callum, those were the three things that work well on Facebook and Instagram. But it's just that you have to adapt that to what's native on the platform. Yeah. And yeah. so for TikTok, it's music, like whatever you're doing has to go with the music, which is the thing that I'm actually most excited about because I'm huge on like gritty ass hip hop, like Matis knows. He's heard my whole like taste in music. Yeah. And it is like the gangster, tough ass puta type of hip hop where like the coming. bass is like, what was that? I didn't see that coming, but not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what Matthew said too. And, um, and like, that's the most exciting part to me is like actually overlaying music to, to the videos. Because I used to do that back when I had my first foray inside digital marketer was being an influencer actually for fashion. And I used to create these like fashion videos and I used to like edit the sequence based on the music. The music actually created the storyboard. Yeah, it's the video almost, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so um, this was like the most exciting part but my experience when creating the TikTok was the copy and I had two different copy and the one that I ended up choosing was actually now this today I'm like that was actually the bad copy you know I posted the bad copy <laughs> in hindsight you know and so I think it's super important that you know Travis Matis and even Rui that we all like really just at least attempt to just create our own TikTok videos and just see what happens and then even that will give us the data points and validating our some of the assumptions that we have i think uh bringing in tiktok you know it, it does bring new set of challenges because like our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter you know so stopping oh, yeah. the you know the thumb stoppers are so important and you know how do you get your message across so quickly and with tiktok you can only put one little sentence there right so there's no more long copy there's no more persuasive you know sales copy or direct response or anything in there it's like you've got just seconds you know to to grab attention and stuff um so I think, yeah, getting in, starting an account and actually getting in the head of a creator and, you know, what, yeah. see what other people are doing is, is very valuable. But also um, you'll see the nuances in the algorithm, yeah. yeah, you know, and it'll, it'll inform you guys on your media buying decisions Yeah. and your, your, your budget allocation essentially. Yeah. And then you'll develop, I think, even more high quality assumptions, or at least like you'll, you'll probably shortcut maybe like 10 assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> like you'll, you'll eventually get there, but then you know, using the platform yourselves, I think will, will get you to like high quality assumptions after. Most interesting thing I've noticed between, because I mean, TikTok and Reels are kind of the same thing to a large extent, but, um, but that's just the differences you can see on the surface. And that's why it's super important to be on both is I've noticed TikTok is, 
TikToks that do way better. I've actually had people say it to me. I mean, I'm a photographer. And so I want to make everything with my camera. And I've had people say to me, like, I scroll past your videos because I think they're adverts because I film it on my camera and they see this high quality thing. And immediately they, they used to seeing cell phone videos and they just go and scroll straight past my video. Whereas reels are like TikTok's almost like a diary kind of feel reels are like an instagram kind of feel you know it's it's way more high quality way more like uh, like right production value versus tiktok where is bare bones take the video on your phone have the the weird robotic voiceover kind of thing it's it's really interesting seeing what works differently on on the platforms and actually hearing people say when your video looks good i scroll straight past because it's it, it looks like an ad but it's going to evolve over time to yeah. the high production. TikTok yeah, I have world. definitely. That's, that's the pattern. Yeah, I've definitely. Uh-huh. Not, I think, was it to you or was it, it might have been to Xenia I was saying the other day. Um, I, I, you really notice as TikTok carries on, the production value just has like skyrocketed and the, it gets harder and harder and harder to go viral on it. My first video that got a decent amount of views was was like, I, I don't know, I think I tricked people into looking at my hand and I did this and it got like 500,000 views. And then, I mean, now for me to, I literally sewed a hat the other day, guys, I'm not joking. I bought a sewing machine and made a hat and got 200,000 views. You know, it's like the, the, the effort that you have to put in just goes way, way more. It's, it's, and TikTok's really geo-limited as well. That's the other thing. So I'm on the, the yes. Sugatan account and it's, I have to, for me to post to, to put TikToks up, they have to go to Lauren first or something, because if I post it in South Africa, it's going to go straight to South Africans and South Africans only. It's it's so hard. You have to fight really hard to get out of your country's suggested videos into. Yep. It's like a like a tier system. It's I remember my one video that got really, really big was like um, it almost it, it almost it's got it's got like a checklist. It's like um it was first south africa and they test your videos as well they don't just you don't just get views so they'll put your video up it got like five thousand views in half an hour then it got two hundred thousand views in the next hour and then it it went 500k a million all south african and then they just started knocking countries off the list there was the uk norway holland boom 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 off the list eventually i think the very last country it got to was the us at the like very end of the line and they literally just knock one off at a time like a like a system See, that's interesting because i didn't notice that until when we were in florida which florida has a lot of little lizards literally everywhere and this and when when i opened my tiktok i got like the funniest viral uh, video around somebody mocking all the lizards inside Florida. (laughs) And that's when I realized it was geo, like geo. Yeah. It was geographical. And I was like, dude, the specificity that they're going for and their algorithm is actually really insane because they just knew I was in Florida and I opted out. I'm on the ask the app. I, I opted out from any tracking. And that's another thing as you use, um, as you use, again, doing that exercise of just opening the app and then just going through it because you start to see ex- exactly how, um, how the algorithm is still eerily accurate, like Facebook, yeah. because um, Mia and I, we started, she started, uh, we started talking about hypnotherapy mm. and uh, we talked about this like on Friday and then Last night, I get my first ad, top of my feed about uh, therapy. So two ads, I got scalp therapy. Um, and then so it was like the device that like gives you therapy through like massaging your scalp. And then another one, which was like some kind of app for, for therapy. And remember, I've opted out. Yeah. You know, so yeah. like, so the, 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 the algorithm is still accurate. That's mm. the thing. But you, you don't know that unless you're actually actively using using and and studying it on your own you know Mm. yeah and it it also like it it doesn't so you know like i said with my other video um which got a lot of views it was kind of that was a super relatable video it ended up getting i think just under 14 million views and it was a video about um you know when you like when there's hardly any milk left in the milk bottle and you pick it up thinking it's going to be heavy and you're like 
pull it out the fridge really aggressively. It was about that. So, I mean, a lot of people relate to that. Everyone who uses milk bottles yeah. has done that. Um, and it went really viral. Then a lot of my other videos, which go, which follow the same pattern where it's, it looks like it's going to get millions of views. If it's something limited, even if I haven't explicitly said it, if it's something only a South African audience finds interesting, it stops at the end of the South African audience. It's like, oh, done. Thank you for playing. That's the end of your, <laughs> that's, that's it. So they, it's really, really like scarily specific. Question for you, Callum. Um, out of like our assumption with viral videos, and the pattern that we've noticed is that out of every, like, let's say 100 videos that you put up, only two of them actually go viral. So we call it a 2% conversion rate. Is yeah, that, I, I think is that, that what you, yeah, I think that's actually pretty spot on to be honest, because the, the, and I suppose TikTok is literally the best way to look at that because your audience actually has no meaning whatsoever on TikTok. I've got 100,000 followers on TikTok. I could post a video and get 200 views. Your followers mean absolutely nothing on TikTok because no one looks at their following feed. Um, and the, I would actually say that's pretty, pretty accurate. You get to know what works and what doesn't. And there was lots of times where obviously it's an assumption, but it's a, it's a really educated one where I would have a video and I would go, I, I mean, this video has to get millions of views and you post it and it just doesn't. It, it, it doesn't you pop. followed, you could, you could follow an exact, an, a, an exact formula for a video and it won't get the same amount of views as, as, I mean, I've even tested it with the same videos. I've had people, um, I still have people say that that video of mine was their favorite video ever on TikTok. And I've posted it probably five, six times since, and it's gotten like 2000 views versus 14 million before, you know, it, it's completely controlled almost. Um, okay, cool. So I guess, I think it's time to wrap up, right? This was like such a, I don't know, it was an interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it, guys. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. That was awesome. <laughs>